thanks everyone for joining our discussion on our recent report on the inadequacies of action taken by the Indonesian government to curb deforestation connected to palm oil. Indonesia's government responded to the country's loss of forests and peatlands and the 2015 fire crisis with a forest clearing ban, a moratorium on issuing of licenses for new palm oil plantations, and tighter peatland policies. Our discussion in this event will cover gaps in the moratoria and also look at ways the government can create more effective policies to cut deforestation. Our panel for this discussion will include me, Matt Pietrowski of Climate Advisors, Sarah Dross, Heiko Sanjaya, and Chris Wiggs of Aid Environment, along with Gerard Reich of Profundo. And first, uh, Sarah will provide a summary of the report, and then we'll, we'll move to the panel discussion. So over to you, Sarah. Yes, thank you, Matt. So let's look right away at the figure at the top left, where we see that Indonesia's annual deforestation rates have uh, decreased. Uh, and also there's this huge drop in deforestation in 2020. So while the Indonesian government attributes this largely to its forest and peat policies, uh, mainly to a clearing ban, the palm oil moratorium, and a strengthening of peatland regulation. Experts, on the other hand, they refer to the unusual wet weather of 2020, the fluctuating palm oil prices and the COVID-19 pandemic that caused an overall downturn in worldwide global economy. Also, we see that the key forest provinces in Indonesia, they do not seem to be part of this downward trend, uh, especially if we look at East Kalimantan, Maluku and West Pap Papua, we see that uh, deforestation rates have increased since 2017. And chain reaction research found that in 2020, uh, there was deforestation of nearly 200,000 hectares in Kalimantan. Also countering the government claim uh, that uh, the drop in deforestation is linked to, uh, to its policies, is uh, actually the recent increase in deforestation inside the moratorium area. Uh, if you also look at the left bottom figure, uh, which is also in Kalimantan, we can see that since early 2021, deforestation inside the is actually increasing, uh, with a peak in April this year, where there was almost 4,000 hectares cleared, which was four times higher than April last year. So the question is whether these uh, government policies moratoriums are effective uh, to, to halt deforestation. And, and if not, what explains uh, these gaps and loopholes in the moratoria? Uh, and in this presentation, I will uh, present on these loopholes. But first, let's have a closer look on, uh, on what these policies entail. So people generally refer to uh, the Indonesian moratorium. Uh, but actually, in fact, there's two moratoria and one regulation that protects Indonesia primary forest and peatland. Uh, and in this figure on the left side, uh, first I will discuss the forest and peat moratorium, which is a ban on any land use licenses for palm oil mining and other agricultural activities on forest and peatland. Uh, then in the middle, I will discuss the palm oil moratorium, uh, which is a ban on issuing of new oil palm licenses. And then on the right side, I will discuss the, the peatland regulation, uh, which is actually a, a, a set of binding rules on peatland clearing, burning and drainage to prevent further degradation and fire exposure of Indonesian peatlands. So I will now dive into the main differences uh, between the moratoria. Um, and also these differences are already a huge indication of the loopholes that uh, already exist. So the first uh, difference is, is that the, only the peatland regulation is a binding regulation. So this means that uh, the other two moratoria, the forest and peat moratorium and the palm oil moratorium, they do not have a firm legal basis. Uh, and this means that this, these moratoria, they do not apply to all. So for instance, it doesn't apply to local government levels. 
uh, nor has it any effective penalties for non-compliance. A second difference is that uh, while the forest and peat moratorium and the peatland regulations are, are permanent, the palm oil moratorium is temporary and it will expire by September this year. Uh, so the forest and peat moratorium, it was first enacted in 2011 and it was made permanent in 2019. And the peatland regulation is permanent since 2016. A third difference is, uh, is on the mandate. So the palm oil moratorium, as the name already suggests, only covers palm oil. Whereas the other policies, they, they are also about land use changes linked to any other agricultural activities uh, and also extraction activities such as mining or industrial logging. A fourth difference is, is that only the forest and peat uh, moratorium has geographical maps that can help monitoring the area. These are called the so-called pivot maps. So each six months, the government releases uh, new maps that show the, the coverage area of the moratorium. So on the exemptions for, for each of the policies, I will discuss them in the next slides where I dive deeper into the loopholes of each of the policies. So the two major gaps in the, in the primary forest and peatland moratorium are the fact that there is this alleged rezoning of moratorium areas and also the fact that secondary forests are not protected. So if we look at the table on the left, which is from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry on the state of forests in Indonesia in 2020, you can see primary forest, secondary forest and plantation forest on the left. And if we follow the line of the secondary forest, uh, we can see a grand total of 42.2% of secondary forest in Indonesia. So by definition, the, the current clearing ban extends only to primary forest and not secondary forest and also not to any disturbed forests. So by definition, uh, these 42 per 42% of secondary forest is potentially at risk of deforestation as it doesn't fall under this moratorium. If the definition would be, for instance, on natural forest, then the moratorium area would, at would have been at least doubled the area. Um, particularly, chain reaction research found that 6.8 million hectare of secondary forest is most, most at risk. Uh, because by design it is meant to be converted for agricultural purposes of uh, transmigration. So if we look again at the table at the secondary forest line uh, and we look at the HPK, which is convertible production forest, we see 3.7 million hectare uh, of for secondary forest. And if we look at the APL, which is here called the non-forest area, uh, it's also called the other use area and it says that 4.9 million hectare of secondary forest is in the APL area. And both this HPK area and this APL area, they still contain uh, also natural forest, they also still contain high biodiversity. Uh, and especially these categories, they are not protected under any uh, legal construction. So that's why we estimated that especially this area is particularly at risk because yeah, it is meant for to be converted. Now I uh, look at the right side where we uh, discussed the, the other major gap is that we see that the moratorium maps, uh, the coverage of those maps, they are decreasing every year. Uh, so since 2011, when the forest and peatland moratorium was first enacted, we see that the coverage area decreased 2.8 million hectare. And even uh, more recently, in the latest map that just came out in 2021, the first period, there was 100,000 hectare less compared to, uh, to the last map of 2020. So the ministry, they, they justify this change in the maps by saying that they have updated uh, license data 
they have confirmed permits prior to 2011, changes in uh, special planning, etc. Uh, but there's a lot of critical organizations that are saying that, uh, that the decrease of the coverage area is linked to, uh, to the Ministry of Environment and Forestry that is deliberately changing the map to accommodate the interest of plantation companies. Uh, and then there is this Greenpeace uh, study that found uh, that was on the, uh, the licensing practice in, in West Papua. And they found that since uh, 2011, there were 14 concessions in West Papua that contained areas that were previously included in the moratorium map as primary forest and seven concessions that were previously included in the map as peatlands and they were subsequently removed from the map prior to the new release of the of the of the map Um, so, and Greenpeace also is saying if the moratorium is permanent, changing the map should not be allowed anymore. So, yeah, basically this is obviously true because if there is this permanent moratorium, there should be no changes in any map. So now let's have a look at the palm oil moratorium. Uh, actually, we identified uh, several um, uh, loopholes in this moratorium. Uh, first major loophole is that there is a lack of coordination and control between central and local level governments. Uh, and as a result, uh, while under the central government, it, it is prohibited to allocate new oil palm concessions in the forest estate, they cannot prevent the allocation of new concessions in the natural forests controlled by Indonesia's local governments. Uh, also, we see unsynchronized uh, boundary mapping uh, and a lack of absent or a lack of regional spatial planning. Um, and this causes overlap of more than 600,000 hectare of oil palm concessions that are actually inside the, the palm oil moratorium. So if you look at the figure on the left, the infograph, uh, this is depicted on the on the bottom left, where there is this palm oil inside the the primary forest and peatland moratorium, this, the the PIBIP maps. Um, third loophole, which is also rather important, is that based on the uh, original permits that were issued prior to 2011, when the the moratorium was enacted. Plantation companies can still clear based on the on the original permit they have. Um, and we, we discussed in the previous slide this APL area, the other use area, that can still contain natural forests. And they might not be included in the moratorium area because these principal permits already exist in the location. So these plantation companies can, uh, if they start the licensing process, they need a principal permit. And if they have already requested this prior to 2011, they can continue with expansion despite the moratorium. Also, there is a lot of non-transparency on palm concession data, which hampers monitoring and governance. Uh, for instance, the so-called cultivation right permits or so-called HAGAU, in theory, they may not have been granted after 2018. Um, however, the government has stopped with the release of public data on these palm concessions. So it's actually impossible to know whether there was any HAGAU released after 2018. Also, the government in after 2015, the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry stopped publishing the identities of companies that requested their concessions to be removed from the moratorium map. Uh, and research found that in Papua, the lack of transparency in the permit process contributed to a proliferation of oil palm concessions. And finally, many palm oil concession licenses have been issued in violation of procedures. For instance, there was an absent HAGAU license before planting. 
So finally, let's have a look at the peatland regulation, which is the only legally binding regulation. Um, so it's important to know that undisturbed and hydrated uh, peatlands are less prone to fire outbreaks. And a lot of fire is actually happening in the peatland area. Uh, so the peatland regulation is basically uh, making a distinction between protected peat uh, and cultivation peat. And the regulation requires that only 30% uh, of the peatland with a protected status, protected status needs to be protected. So this implies that 70% 70, 70 of the peat with cultivation status can still be drained under certain uh, limitations. And the, the one of the key limitation is the 14 centi 40 centimeter rule, which requires that um, um, that the sorry that the groundwater level remains less than 40 centimeter below the surface um, and this also implies that the 70 percent of peat with cultivation status can still be drained to some extent and uh, environmentalists say that any dra drainage uh, could still lead to further degradation of peatlands the loss of stored carbon and an increased risk of fire and even the 30% of protected peat is not that safe because we also found that uh, permit holders that do already have a permit can still continue to uh, drain protected peat areas. And this was also confirmed uh, by government uh, sources. So let's have a look on, on what this actually hap what this actually entails for uh, for what's happening at at the moment. And that's basically that we see that the exploitation of moratoria loopholes and the lack of sanctions incentivizes further deforestation, fires, and degradation of peatlands. Um, so first of all, we saw that palm concessions inside forest and peat moratorium areas expanded after 2018. And according to the 2018 palm oil mortar, moratorium, this should not be allowed any longer, but it still happens. The numbers on this are, are not that reliable, but in every data source that we found, we saw expansion of uh, palm concessions. Um, also, we witnessed that deforestation and fires continue to happen in primary forest and peatlands. So if you have a look at the figure on the left, all the red areas that are indicated there show deforestation inside the moratorium map of 2020. Um, also, as I said before, in Kalimantan in 2020, we observed 192,229 hectares of deforestation in Kalimantan, of which 30% was palm oil related. So this means that it was also inside the oil palm plantation concessions. Uh, and 14,513 hectare of that expanded inside the moratorium. So this is my last slide. Um, also, we saw that fires uh, continue at, uh, at the usual annual rate, rates. Um, so at, actually the, the 2019 fire season largely exceeded the scale of the 2018 fire season and in 2018 the, the palm oil moratorium was established. Um, so in the left figure we see a, a part of Sumatra uh, and the red dots are NASA fire alerts this year from January to May and you can see that there's a lot of uh, alerts inside the, the yellow peatland area and also inside the light green moratorium area. Uh, forest fires in Indonesia over the last three years are classified as high, uh, with the majority occurring uh, in the peat ecosystem. And also our analysis reveals that uh, more than 1,000 oil palm concessions cover 6.6 .6 million hectares operating in peat areas. Um, and as we saw, this peat regulation uh, still leaves much room for drainage. So actually, uh, this whole area is at risk of some form of degradation. 
through plantation expansion and drainage. So that was my part of the presentation. Uh, we now continue with the discussion, so I give the word to Matt. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for that presentation. That was great. And now on to the uh, discussion. So first, I want to start with you, Sarah. Um, one of your early slides um, discussed uh, the deforestation rates in Indonesia. So overall, deforestation rates seem to be stabilizing since 2014-2015. Um, what is the reason for this? Yeah. Um, so indeed, there's, there seems to be this general trend of uh, stabilizing deforestation rates. And we believe this is partly the result of, uh, of increased coverage of so-called NDPE policies. So no de deforestation, no peat and no exploitation policies by the palm oil industry. Um, for instance, chain reaction research found that 83% uh, of all refinery capacity in, uh, in Indonesia and Malaysia is covered by these NDPE policies. Um, also, other chain reaction research found that, uh, that indeed deforestation seems to be slowing down, but it, it also remains at the same time the same deforesters that, that continue with uh, clearing primary forests and peatlands, and also that continue to leak uh, unsustainable palm oil in the market. Um, another reason for the decline is simply because there's also fewer forests left to be cleared. Uh, so the palm oil industry first largely uh, cleared forests in Sumatra and Borneo for its uh, large palm oil industry expansion. Um, and since 2017, we see that they are increasingly uh, expanding into Papua's forests, where there's still a lot of remaining forests left. Um, yeah, so basically what our paper has shown is that the moratorium policies in, in Indonesia will probably not provide sufficient uh, protection uh, for this primary forest and peatland on the long run. Uh, and especially these forests in Papua uh, remain at risk of deforestation. I'd like to now turn to Harad Reich of Profundo and ask some questions about investor exposure. How are financiers and investors affected by the uh, issue of these gaps in the Indonesian moratoria? Yes, thank you. Um, well, a major part of the Indonesian palm oil industry is financed by uh, Indonesian banks um, and other banks in Southeast Asia, as well as Japanese banks, um, as well as shareholders. Um, and in this group, uh, and certainly in the group of uh, finances from the European Union, uh, many shareholders and banks, they have zero deforestation policies. Um, and these might have the risk, these investors and banks, uh, to have a conflict in this financing and, and, uh, and uh, versus their policies. So they might face a substantial reputational risk. And this might uh, turn into a financial risk. Can you elaborate more on why this might turn into a, a financial risk and what the implications would be? Yes. Um, well, as supply chain actors in the palm oil refinery states, in oligochemical uh, industry, um, and in the downstream uh, sector, like fast moving consumer goods and retail companies, uh, are eager to, to cut their links from deforestation. Uh, leakage actors in every stage of the chain might be hurt by uh, market access risk. Uh, they might be hurt by financing risk and they might be hurt by, by, by reputation risk. Uh, and this, if this happens, this could decline, this could lead to a severe decline in, uh, in the value of equity. Uh, and it might even lead to debt restructuring when the cash flows of these companies, of these actors linked to deforestation, uh, would decline strongly. Um, and important to note here is that last but not least, uh, the European regulation on sustainable financing and on uh, supply chain due diligence 
uh, might lead to a hold of financing of unsustainable practices with a significant impact on the value of assets linked to deforestation. Thanks a lot for that, Gerard. Now uh, back to the aid environment team. How can the government of Indonesia create more meaningful solutions or policies to reduce deforestation and fires? Heiko, can you answer that? Okay, thanks for the questions. And yeah, uh, to create a more effective policy to reduce deforestation, the government could uh, uh, establish or craft policy via a legally uh, bending presidential regulation instead of a legally weak presidential instructions. Also, the government can extend regulation to secondary forests, as many of these areas still contain high bio biodiversity and uh, tree cover. Um, yeah, moreover, without an effective one map policy, because right now Indonesia is still working on the creating one map policy that integrate all the data together digitally. Uh, a policy aimed at standardizing and unifying spatial data across Indonesia. Overlapping of, uh, in palm oil plantation in forest area would look likely continue to occur in the future if the one map policy is not ready yet uh, or maybe accomplished. Other measures to increase the effectiveness of the moratorium include the acceleration of the review of existing palm oil plantation permits, enforcement, of uh, the law against violators of licensing procedures and rule for zero new pitland drainage, and also an equitable profit sharing scheme between palm oil producing regions and the central governments. And yeah, equally important is a roadmap for implementation of palm oil monitoring. Can I ask a question to Heiko? Heiko, can you explain why this uh, equitable profit sharing scheme is necessary? Yeah. Uh, equitable is, is very uh, beneficial, it is very important, the equitable uh, profit sharing, because when the moratoria, when the area in regions uh, get this destroyed or maybe get uh, yeah get destroyed by the palm oils or maybe for the forestry activities they can establish or maybe can build uh, the or repair the broken or maybe the 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 destroy uh, caused by the operations it means that they have more uh, uh, fundings to maintain their uh, uh, profit, uh, they, 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 their broken things, I think, in the, the infrastructure. For example, uh, if there is a lot of activities happens in the forest, uh, like uh, they can manage to fix uh, the forest itself by the profit sharings uh, from uh, the central government. And this regulation is very important because when we see uh, the uh, mining sectors, they are have their, they are having the profit equitable uh, sharings. And but for palm oil, there is lack of the profitable sharings between central government uh, and the uh, regional governments. And is is very sad to say because uh, if there is something happens. Uh, or maybe something bad happens, or maybe uh, the infrastructure gets uh, uh, broken in the regions or in, in the region area, there, uh, the governments of uh, uh, regional government cannot fix the broken things because they don't have the uh, reserve or maybe the funding to fix that because there's no regulations uh, manage, there are no regulation uh, of the profit equitable sharings. And I think that's that's now is been provoked by uh, some several uh, regions, several head 
uh, regional uh, leaders in Indonesia to have a profit profitable uh, equitable profit sharing uh, to the uh, from the central government. Thanks, Heiko, for that detailed explanation. Uh, back to Sarah, uh, I'd like to discuss uh, follow up on what you were discussing about the moratoria loopholes. Did the Palm Oil moratorium not also require mandatory review of existing permits? Why does this not present, prevent plantation companies from continued clearing? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, I forgot to mention indeed here that in the palm oil moratorium, it's not only a ban on the issuance of new oil palm licenses, but it also requires a, a mandatory review of uh, existing permits. Um, and indeed, if this, if this, uh, yeah, if this review of existing permits would happen, that it then it could maybe counterbalance some of the loopholes that I have discussed in this presentation. Uh, for instance, I have discussed this uh, fact that companies who started their uh, licensing procedure before May 2011 can still uh, clear natural forest and peatland based on the on the original permit they had. Um, but yeah, in, in reality, this there's little evidence that this mandatory permit review is uh, systematically implemented. So there is this example uh, in West Papua where the local government uh, together with the anti-corruption agency KPK, they did a review of, uh, of all licenses in West Papua and they found uh, many irregularities and violations of, uh, of existing permits. Uh, for instance, they found that 22 palm oil companies uh, had seen a release of their forest estate between September 2018 and August 2020 when the palm oil moratorium was already implemented. Um, so criti critical organizations are saying that if, if the government would do this for the whole Indonesia and not only in this uh, case study in West Papua, then yeah, then it would probably reveal a lot of violations of procedures and then probably a lot of licenses uh, yeah will be um, will 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 what many companies might lose their their licenses then uh, but so far there's no evidence of any uh, systematic mandatory review you stated that the peatland peatland ban is legally binding so why is there still so much damage and so many fires inside peatlands Heiko, can you answer that one? Uh, yeah. Uh, despite legally binding peatland regulation, the legal measure chosen by uh, the government and mostly is just administrative uh, sanctions uh, and consider weak and on the enforcement. Uh, so far, for any damage in peatlands, uh, the Ministry of uh, Environmental and Forestry has preferred ad administrative steps, such as the compensations process without uh, revoking the license or criminal sanctions against the failures or of the regulation in peat areas. And since uh, 2015 until 2019, 258 administrative sanctions were imposed on the perpetrators uh, with the 51 criminal charges and the 21 civil lawsuit uh, filed. Uh, eventually, the ministry had filed uh, 19 civil lawsuits and guilty verdict in nine of these cases. And the companies were fined for material compensation and restoration. However, until April 2020, only one company complied and paid the fine. With the week, with this week monitoring, monitoring and law enforcement carried out by the government, the rate of forest fires on peat will likely to continue to occur. And yeah, probably it will likely have a serious impact 
and on both the environment and the social communities around. Thanks a lot for that, Heiko. So now we're gonna to go to our last topic. Um, we'll be looking forward and, and discussing what will happen after September, 2021, when the temporary palm oil moratorium will end. Does anybody want to um, tackle what they think will happen going forward? Jump into to this one. Um, that no one knows. <clears throat> That's the first thing you have to acknowledge, um, that we don't know what will happen and we don't know whether it will be extended. Um, there are organizations working towards that. But what we do know is that the current climate in Indonesia is one where the government wants to develop. They enacted um, a law last year, which is referred to as the omnibus law, which um, reduced and removed some of these sort of environmental safeguards and regulations um, that were in place. And um, it's designed to encourage investment. Um, so some of the things it removes is the stipulation that each province has to maintain 30% forest cover. Some of the environmental impact assessment regulations are weakened. Um, there's also a revision to a mining law, which does a similar thing. So the, the political context in Indonesia is one where um, there's a desire to encourage investment and that is, seems to be coming at the expense of environmental regulations. Um, so there's a concern that that's what will happen, that there will be um, more development and um, encouragement of investment and that might, if the moratoria ends, then um, that will make it easier and the government will push to open up some of these forest areas. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that the, the NDP policies have had a significant impact in the industry. So it's unlikely that um, companies operating in the NDP market or the sort of palm oil growers and buyers that people people know about the big brands and the big names they will not move into forest areas um, the problem is that there is still this sort of leakage market and these companies operating outside of ndp markets um, who are still clearing and might take advantage of any loosening of environmental protection so you might start seeing some of these obscure more obscure palm oil growers who likely sell to sort of um, markets in India or China, they might take advantage of um, forested areas being opened up. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, we're gonna end the discussion there. So thanks to all the panelists for their time for this important discussion and thanks for everybody for tuning in.